I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at National Instruments with Alejandra Bertica, who's going to talk today about some of the new challenges of testing 5G devices. So Alejandro, as we get into this new world of 5G, which is on everybody's mind, what sort of problems are we running into? Well, we have to take into consideration the new architectural changes to the radios to the front ends. So now we have to deal with new high bandwidth signals. Now we have to talk about new architectures for operating below 6 gigahertz and operating at millimeter wave frequencies. We have to deal with uh, beam forming of these signals to overcome propagation losses. And that creates a new set of challenges for designers working on these new devices. How much of this fits into the world of testing? Well, there's quite a bit of characterization work that has to take place to make sure that uh, these new technologies work well with uh, new types of signals. So we're doing quite a bit of work with uh, designers and engineers to make sure that uh, their devices are characterized and tested to perform properly at new frequencies and with new signal types. Why don't you draw this out for us? Sure, let me do that. So Alejandro, what are we looking at here? So if we take a look at the frequency spectrum, we have to plan for new 5G devices to operate both at frequencies that are below 6 gigahertz, or more of the traditional cellular frequencies, um, where we're going up to about 6 gigahertz. And uh, although we have to work with wider signals, we sort of understand the behavior of the signals at these frequencies and the devices that are handling these signals. But now, as we move into the frequency range 2, or the millimeter wave range, uh, from more or less 24 gigahertz to, uh, say, about uh, 45 or 50 gigahertz, uh, then we have to deal with a new set of challenges. Uh, so we have wider channels here, and we have different uh, subcarrier spacing, different characteristics of how the signal is going to propagate. And we have to then work with these new types of uh, devices and the architectures of the radios needed to overcome the propagation losses, like, for example, using beamforming to have more radiated power in specific directions. And beamforming is not a new idea, but it's never been tested at this level, right? But it's, it's been tested at some level, and we've had beamforming uh, architectures like uh, for radars and for the airspace industry, for example. But now we're targeting these beamforming architectures for the mass market, for mass uh, adoption of these technologies. So we have to find a way to test millions of devices uh, in a way that's cost effective, in a way that inspires confidence into the solution that's going to be deployed in the field. So if we take a look at, at some of these at these new radio architectures, it used to be that we had sort of a single input and uh, an output type of uh, amplifier, for example, or, or front end. And now we have to deal with the, uh, the growth of these into devices that are going to be beamforming the signal. So we have not only uh, gain control, but we also have to think in terms of uh, phase control. So now we have uh, power that we have to deal with and, and phase of the signal. And then these devices are going to go to uh, uh, an antenna array. So we're going to have a number of these beamforming architectures or, or front ends. They're going to go to arrays that are going to start steering the beam in particular directions. And then, of course, we have to maintain reciprocity because 5G at these frequencies is all uh, TDD. So we transmit, then we receive at the same frequency. So now we have to make sure that uh, we are uh, receiving the signal uh, in the right way. So coming from the same antenna kind of thing. So these architectures, now we have to test these devices. And we also have to test the performance of these devices when they interact with other components around them and see what effect they have on this performance. And one of the reasons behind the beam forming is that with 5G, particularly at the millimeter wave, uh, wavelengths, you're starting to deal with things like trees and people will interrupt signals, which you didn't have before, right? With 4G, it would go around a corner. You could probably run through windows and, and even walls. Mm -hmm. Right. So now at these frequencies, uh, the fraction of the signal is not the same as we had uh, below 6 gigahertz. The signal is not going to bend, like you're saying. 
So uh, part of the technology includes making sure that we're targeting uh, the specific user and that we can focus enough energy to compensate for those losses as the signal tries to travel through uh, water or through glass or through leaves of, of a tree or things like that. So that's why we're taking advantage of this array gain when we have multiple antennas, 64, 128, to gain more uh, power and to focus that signal uh, in a specific direction to target those users and then overcome what was lost through the air. What changes on the waveform itself? How does that look versus at in millimeter wave versus uh, uh, sub six versus four uh, G? So when we look at some of these signals at millimeter wave uh, frequencies, we have to take into account that the channel bandwidths are going to increase. So we're going to have a much greater channel bandwidth. We here when we work at six gigahertz, we're talking about a maximum one hundred megahertz of channel bandwidth. When we look at these um, channels at uh, millimeter wave frequencies, the channel uh, bandwidths increase from uh, 100 megahertz to 200 megahertz, and then currently up to 400 megahertz. Uh, but that's just the channel bandwidth. When we start aggregating these carriers, we could have bandwidths that are much larger, so we can be in excess of a gigahertz of bandwidth, especially when we're looking at downlink signals. We could have multiple carriers that have been aggregated, and then the downlink bandwidth is quite significant. So another piece that's come into this is over-the-air testing. Now, over-the-air testing has been done in the past, but it's never been done at the volume. It has to be done, same as what you're talking about here. What does that entail, uh, particularly as you start getting things like antennas that are wrapping around packages and uh, uh, no exposed leads? Right, so these new architectures are pushing designers to work with more, uh, you know, smaller and smaller devices. And in many cases, we lose the ability to connect RF probes <clears throat> or cables to these devices. So a small antenna and package device that's... Uh, that's going to go on a um, handheld device, for example, or in a small <clears throat> customer premise equipment, is not going to have uh, connectors that we can attach to. It, rather, it's going to have just some printed antennas on the top uh, connected to uh, the architecture underneath. So these devices, we need to characterize how they are performing in a real world condition when surrounded by a number of other things. So we could have a number of circuits around it, that could detune the antenna. Uh, we could have uh, the screen that's uh, supposed to be not uh, interfering with it, but now there's a lot of noise. And as components get thinner and thinner, there's more of that noise escaping and affecting other circuits. So what we're trying to do is characterize the performance not only of these devices over the air. Now that we have no connectors, we have to make sure that they're uh, forming their beams in a particular direction, that they can steer them up to a certain angle and things like that. So we have to use controlled RF environments to make sure these devices are performing properly. And now we also go one step beyond making sure that when they are put in a system that they perform uh, properly when surrounded by other components. So for that, uh, we use this over-the-air test to test it in a more realistic uh, set of conditions. Although we maintain sort of the, the silence and the quietness of an RF enclosure, of a chamber, uh, we still try to see how the device is performing uh, when uh, radiating the signal, so when, when transmitting and when receiving uh, at high frequencies. Do you test that as well in a real-world environment where you have lots of these signals being transmitted at the same time? Uh, we are anticipating people that are integrating, you know, designers that are working with, with these uh, components to test them in those sort of real-world conditions and see how well it can discriminate from uh, the real signal from interferers or from uh, reflections and things like that. Uh, currently, we're, we're focusing on enabling the characterization, the validation uh, of these devices. As you can imagine, there's a big challenge when we try to move from, from characterizing how this device performs in space, and we have to move it around and manipulate it and make sure that in every direction we can fully characterize the antenna. Uh, and then trying to move that into a production environment 
well, how are we going to make sure that this device can steer the beam in certain directions, that it was manufactured properly in when the volume is going to be in the millions? So there's a big challenge of what do we do to characterize over the air these devices? What is that going to do to test uh, production floor f flows, to the cost of these solutions, to uh, the ability to deploy en masse? So there's also been talk along the way about changing materials as well. So things like uh, silicon germanium, uh, uh, GAN, does that affect any of this? Is, is, is the testing still the same regardless of the material? In general, some of the measurements are, are similar. We're still looking for parametric results on power, parametric uh, results on uh, the effect on the face, the linearity of the devices, how well they, they perform under high bandwidth uh, signals. So some of those measurements are going to be the same. Now there's, of course, characterization in terms of power consumption and the efficiency of different types of design approaches. So our customers have to deal with uh, that kind of uh, design challenge. So basically you have a full stack of testing as opposed to just one type of test. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. You have different test sequences and test approaches for different technologies to characterize uh, what is special about moving to a different type of semiconductor technology. Alejandro Boratica, thanks for a great explanation. I appreciate the opportunity.